Good afternoon. Welcome back to a, another special edition of Out and About. Today is October 19th, 2020. We are in Pride Month here in Hawaii. Uh, even though we are in a special lockdown case, we have an extra special uh, guest coming back who has been uh, pivotal in the expansion of rights for LGBTQ people, both in Hawaii, the nation, and the world. We're delighted to have Justice Stephen Levinson back with us. As you uh, may have uh, caught our show two weeks ago, and if you haven't, go back on the Think Tech profile. Uh, Justice Levinson and I were discussing the um, uh, the case Bear versus Lewin, the first uh, marriage equality case uh, in uh, it was the first appellate court decision in American history that granted that a state's marriage laws were presumptively unconstitutional for discriminatorily prohibiting same-sex couples from marry marrying. At the time, same-sex marriage was le legally recognized nowhere in the world. Uh, this bare decision catalyzed the push for marriage equality, equality uh, in the U.S. and beyond. And as you know, today in most of Western Europe, uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, uh, almost all of Latin America, uh, it is the law of the land. Justice Levinson has authored many opinions. He has a very storied history as a jurist, and we are happy to welcome him back. So thank you so much for being with us. Well, it's great fun and a pleasure to be back. Thanks so much, Winston. Well, we where we left off a couple the last time, and there's just so much to unpack here, and especially because this is not a this is not a done deal. Uh, we're seeing right now people are very interested in uh, who's getting um, appointed to the Supreme Court and what does that mean uh, for a lot of different laws in our land? And well, the entire process is, I, I suppose, a bit troubling, but it's just, it is what it is. Uh, so as we look in terms of where we left off with this marriage equality case, and I thought it was very interesting that uh, Judge Amy uh, Barrett did not, would not comment on uh, Obergefell and, and other very important issues and probably wise not to say anything about anything, but some things seem like she could have opined on, but given the state of things, I understand what she did. Um, where we left off last time, we'd gone through what Bear versus Lewin had come down to, and we, we were just getting to the backlash. So run us through the, the what happened with with uh, the ruling and then where does it go from there in DOMAs and the change to the state constitution here in Hawaii? Well, we uh, last time uh, we talked about the tizzy that the, the Bear v. Lewin lawsuit um, threw the legislature into, the state legislature. Because the immediate impact of Bear v. Lewin was on the state of Hawaii the, in terms of what the Hawaii state constitution had to say about whether marriage should or needed to be or must uh, or, or was required to be uh, opened up to same-sex couples. Uh, the uh, the Bear v. Lewin decision by the Hawaii Supreme Court uh, held that, as you said, uh, withholding access of the legal stat status of marriage from uh, same-sex couples presumptively violated Hawaii's Equal Protection Clause, which prohibited invidious discrimination on the basis of sex. Uh, the, the court remanded the matter, sent the matter back to the trial court because there had been no trial yet. Uh, in the case, it had come up because the circuit court had essentially thrown the, the case out very early on. And so we held no. Nope, the, uh, the plaintiffs, the Bear plaintiffs, the three um, uh, couples, had alleged facts which stated a claim for constitutional relief, that um, the state's equal protection clause prohibiting um, 
invidious sex discrimination uh, presumed that marriage should be available to same-sex couples unless the state could demonstrate a compelling interest in its sex discrimination and withholding uh, the, acts, uh, uh, the, the legal status of marriage from same-sex couples. So the matter went to trial, finally, in 1996, about three years after the decision came down. The uh, trial court, Kevin Chang, uh, wrote his decision at the end of 1996, and no surprise, he found in favor of the three same-sex couples and against the state or the director of health. Um, the compelling interest that the state claimed that it had in limiting marriage to opposite sex couples was that children are ideally raised, child rearing ideally takes place in an envir environment where there is a nuclear family consisting of a mom, a dad, and the kids. Uh, the, at trial, the plaintiffs had two expert witnesses. The only witnesses at the trial were expert witnesses because everybody agreed to the essential facts, which were that in uh, late 1990, the, the plaintiffs, the three couples, had asked for marriage license applications. They had been refused on the basis that they were same-sex couples and therefore not eligible for marriage. Therefore, it was pointless to give them marriage license applications. Uh, and that, that was it. So uh, at trial, uh, the party stipulated to those facts, agreed that those, those things happened. And so the um, state, which had the initial burden of demonstrating a compelling state interest in that sex discrimination, had two expert witnesses. And their job was to prove that child rearing takes place best with a mom and a dad. The Three couples also had two expert witnesses. And their expert witnesses testified that of all the research that had been done up to date to that date on the subject of child rearing and the and the the, the most uh, beneficial form of the family in which the children are being raised, did not prove that children are raised any better by a mom and a dad than they are by two same-sex people, by a grandmother, by a mom only, by a dad only. And on cross-examination, the state's witnesses essentially crumbled and conceded, yes, that's true. There is no research supporting our opinion that a mom and a dad and the kids are the ideal environment for child rearing. And based on that, uh, Judge Chang ruled in favor of the three same-sex couples. Was and that, that and, was, and was that the state's only real argument? Was that this was just a better situation for kids? Yes. Okay. Because they had to come up with a compelling interest in... Uh, uh, withholding marriage from same-sex couples, and they certainly couldn't advance homophobia as that compelling state interest. And in fact, they didn't. They 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 weren't. They they weren't relying on on homophobia as the reason for withholding marriage from same-sex couples, uh, and they lost. Uh, now, at that point, Congress, fearing this result, 
that the plaintiffs would win and that same-sex marriage would be recognized in Hawaii and that therefore married same, uh, couples, same-sex couples married in Hawaii would come to the mainland and hold themselves out in, as married and pollute the mainland with their tainted marriages, uh, Congress enacted the Defense of Marriage Act. Again, as a direct response to what was happening in Hawaii in Bear v. Lewin. And my God, what will happen if, if married people uh, of the same sex come to the mainland from Hawaii? And was that was the was that that was the Defense of Marriage Act that was passed? That was the Defense of Marriage Act, which said two things. It said if state A recognizes a same sex marriage, that doesn't require state B to recognize those people as married if they come to state B. And it also said, and not only that, the federal government does not recognize same sex marriage. And so you may say you're married, but we say for purposes of getting the benefit of, of federal law, you aren't married. And I, was, I misspoke the last time we were together. The thousand plus rights and benefits that flow from marriage that Dan Foley had recited uh, in his briefing to the Hawaii Supreme Court uh, came from state law alone, he didn't even get to the matter of the rights and benefits, uh, duties and obligations as well of, of marriage under federal law. Wow. Uh, and so the Defense of Marriage Act became law in 1996. And in the meantime, a lot of negotiation was taking place in the Hawaii legislature. What are we going to do about this case uh, in which the Hawaii courts have held that um, the Hawaii Constitution requires that access to, be ma to marriage be extended to same-sex couples? And the first thought that came to opponents of same-sex marriage was, let's amend the Constitution to do away with what the Hawaii Supreme Court and then the Circuit Court at trial have created. And so uh, the legislature proposed an amendment to the state constitution directly addressing the matter of same-sex marriage. Ironically, this new provision was to be placed in the Bill of Rights of the Hawaii Constitution, and it ultimately was. In uh, November 1998, I mistakenly said 96, two weeks ago, but, it, but on the November 1998 ballot, the good people of the land of Aloha, overwhelmingly by roughly a 70 to 30% margin ratified the proposed constitutional amendment that reserved to the legislature the sole power to restrict marriage to opposite sex couples or to open marriage up to same sex couples sometime in the future. And most people in Hawaii simply assumed that that was the end of it, that the Hawaii legislature would never recognize same-sex marriage. But things change. And as uh, many of us remember, um, states began to recognize same-sex civil union as a kind of second-class form of marriage. Essentially, giving same-sex uh, uh, same couples access to all of the bennies and also all of the duties of marriage, but calling the relationship something else, calling it civil union. But, uh, but it was definitely second class and also restricted just to a state and didn't, uh, I mean, it was, uh, I, I suppose we have the research typical beneficiaries law, which is different still. I think you can name your, your sibling or your parent in that one, can't you? Almost nobody took advantage of that, so it's really not even worth talking about. We could, we could get into those weeds. Uh, in, in, in the negotiation, one of the possibilities 
urged by opponents of same-sex marriage was to create a second class uh, status called reciprocal beneficiaries in which brothers and sisters could be reciprocal beneficiaries, parents and children could be reciprocal beneficiaries. In other words, making it very, very different from marriage and also limiting the rights and benefits that would flow from that. And, and those that, were, the, and that was seems to take, like take care of someone for your pension or um, rights to visit them right. in the hospital or those. Well, that was the idea, but it was obvious to everyone proponents and opponents would, uh, would be satisfied with a reciprocal beneficiary status. And, and so what was ultimately negotiated was the amendment that was put out for ratification by the electorate uh, on the November 1998 ballot. And that was overwhelmingly approved by uh, the Hawaii electorate, which showed that the level of opposition to same-sex marriage in Hawaii was virtually the same. It was identical to the level of opposition to same-sex marriage uh, in the rest of the country, in the rest of the United States. And at that time, was there some attempt made to make a sort of, sort of civil unions, or did that come down the road much later uh, in Hawaii? That came down the road later, and I'll get to it. Okay. But in the meantime, uh, other states were getting on the bandwagon. I think uh, Vermont may have been the first judicially to recognize civil union for same-sex couples that uh, afforded all of the rights and benefits under state law uh, to partners to a civil union as partners to a marriage uh, received under state law in Vermont. Other states followed suit, and then in the early 2000s, Massachusetts became the first state judicially to decree under its state constitution that it was unlawful, unconstitutional to deny same-sex couples who were otherwise eligible to be married, but for their gender, access to the legal status of same-sex marriage. And after Massachusetts opened the door, other states began jumping on the bandwagon too. Now, in the meantime, back in Hawaii, uh, proponents were taking first things first and were lobbying the Hawaii state legislature for a bill that would recognize same-sex uh, civil union for same-sex couples. Uh, strictly speaking, civil union could be available to opposite sex couples also. It wasn't marriage, but it would afford all of the rights and benefits of marriage to partners to a civil union. And um, it, uh, one could argue, was marriage in everything but name. But the fact that it was not called marriage uh, made it unacceptable to a lot of proponents because of the implications of having to create a new animal, uh, a new uh, status that same-sex couples could have access to, but the, but uh, uh, still barring them from access to marriage. So the, the idea from the very beginning was to try to get civil union first and then go for full marriage equality. And so the marriage equality, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Equality Hawaii that I sat on the board of for a number of years, which was the then largest single LGBTQ advocacy uh, group in Hawaii began lobbying hard for same-sex marriage. Um, GLAD 
lobbied, uh, began lobbying hard for civil union. Um, Glad did, uh, uh, and other local organizations did. Then the American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii, of Hawaii began uh, uh, to uh, become part of that mix in a big way. Um, we, uh, some outside big guns like uh, Evan Wolfson, who I think everybody knows of, um, became part of the effort as well. This was all during the period of time in which Linda Lingle was uh, the governor of the state of Hawaii. And for those who may not know, what years are you, are you talking about? Then she point? was the governor uh, beginning in 2002 and ending in 2010. So in, in 2009, uh, the uh, advocacy group succeeded in persuading the legislature to get behind civil union uh, and pass it into law. And uh, the House of Representatives passed it it uh, crossed, it went over to the Senate, and at the very last minute, uh, as a result of some parliamentary maneuvering engaged in by the president of the Senate, who at the time was Colleen Hanabusa, and the Senate majority leader, who I believe at the time was Sean uh, Tsutsui, uh, the bill was deferred, was recommitted, was sent back to committee and effectively killed for that legislative session. That upset a lot of people. We got some assurances from the leadership and the legislature that we should not worry because next year they would go, they would actually do it. And in fact, in 2010, the Hawaii legislature passed a civil union bill, which then went to the governor for a signature. And the governor had 30 days from the day that she received the civil union bill to sign it, allow it to go into law without her signature or veto it. And on the very last day, she announced a press conference, invited people who had been active in support of civil union and in opposition to the press conference, which took place in the uh, ante room of uh, the governor's offices on the fourth floor of the Capitol. And uh, with that audience present, and the matter being uh, filmed by the media and recorded by the media, the governor announced her veto of the civil union bill. Uh, people were pretty upset by that, who had supported civil union and felt that they had been stabbed in the back. Um, but uh, Governor Lingle's term was about up. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the next year, Neil Abercrombie became the governor of Hawaii. And he announced publicly and made it very clear that he would be happy to sign a civil union bill. And in fact, if that were the first bill to reach his desk, that would be the first bill that he would sign into law. And so the legislature repassed the civil union bill and Governor Abercrombie immediately signed it. And so, uh, and by that time it was 2011. And so in very early 2012, civil union uh, became legal and available to couples who wanted to avail themselves of that status. So I, I civil unioned a lot of couples, including interestingly enough, one opposite sex couple who I asked why 
do you want civil union if you can have marriage? And they didn't have a very uh, clear answer to that, but they wanted civil union. So that was fine. They were eligible. But for about uh, two years, lots and lots of same-sex couples took advantage of the newly created status of civil union in Hawaii. In the meantime, proponents of marriage equality were following through on their game plan. And I was part of that. And that was once civil union was in the bag, go for full on marriage equality. And, and that, that, that's interesting because Massachusetts in 2004, when they legalized marriage, here we're still in the land of Aloha, eight years later, when we're just getting civil unions passed, where, where Bear v. Lewin was, when did it first come up in 91 or something like that? So Well, the, law, the lawsuit was filed in 91 and the Supreme Court decision was filed in 93 and the uh, trial ended with the, the, uh, the trial judge's judgment in favor of the same-sex couples at the end of 1996. Uh, yes, and so w w the shot that we fired went all around the world, but in the meantime, the ripples hadn't come back to Hawaii yet. Well, and I think it's still going around the world. And, you know, it's, it's unbelievable because we're, we've just gotten up to this point now in, in history and we are uh, it had just gone about 30 minutes, which is incredible because I, there's so much more to unpack here. And so that's 20 years time frame we're talking about there. We did God, have, we've been talking for 30 minutes again. We had, but, and we, we, we have things so we haven't gotten to, to uh, uh, Windsor, to, to, uh, to uh, Obergefell. We haven't gotten to what's coming down the pike here. Um, a lot of different questions about like Kim Davis. We haven't, even gotten, to, we haven't even gotten the marriage equality. We uh, haven't gotten the marriage equality. We had a, which I will say for the record before you have to sign off, went, went into effect on December 2, 2013 in Hawaii, making Hawaii, I think, the 15th state in the United States to recognize marriage equality the federal government not yet having done it. Which we were, are going to have to get to in our next installment, because uh, there's a lot, a lot of history here, but it's also a lot of uh, jurisprudence that uh, you will be able to help us with, um, explain there. And we did have a question from a viewer who asked us, there's cases where people refuse to sell houses to LGBTQ people. How much further do you think we have to work to get LGBTQ? people to the same rights. So I think that is a great question and maybe one we can leave until the next time because let's just say we're not there yet and we still got a lot of work to do, but what you've done, what you contributed to, the shot around the world that's reverberating came back to Hawaii. Um, we've gotten up to a certain point now here in Hawaii, so if you will be so kind as to um, continue this discussion in a couple of weeks, uh, it would be my honor and privilege to have you back. Happy uh, to do it. Okay, because it's a, a, a lot to unpack here. And then and there's other questions I just want to ask, like, what keeps you up at night right now? And, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, those sorts of things that, that are uh, beyond the scope of this right here. But um, for right now, we have to, unfortunately, wrap it up. But this is our Pride Month, so this is our little contribution to, um, you know, a fuller, freer, expanded um, America, Hawaii, and we thank you for your part in that. Thank you for taking part in this today, helping us to understand the background of this and that this is not ancient history. This is very recent and uh, relevant and important and still kind of ongoing. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, thank Winston, you. and look forward to continuing it in two weeks. Thank you, Justice. And uh, for all you watching, catch our first installment from a couple weeks ago and then look forward to us being back here in a couple weeks. So, aloha, everyone.